getting set then for the market open. There comes the bell after a day's break. We are starting off tempered for both the Nifty as well as the Sensex. Pretty quiet, one would have to say, although these are early days. I don't think we're going to quite follow what the US equity markets or the Asia handover was. Nifty Bank lower by about half a percent. That's pretty much doable for us. The breadth as well hasn't really plunged or anything. Uh, a decline of 846 to 566 account on advances is pretty doable. We've definitely had worse days. It's the IT and the metals, the globally linked sectors which are actually underperforming what the benchmarks of the Nifty or the Nifty Bank rather is currently doing. They're the ones which are uh, taking a, a bigger knock, about a percent or over a percent is the kind of move that they're currently seeing in trade. Let's first start with the Adani group names. That's where all the news uh, off late has been, uh, be it Adani Ports. Uh, be it Adani Enterprises, Adani Transmission or for that matter Adani Green, a lot of promoter shareholding has been released and all of these stocks are holding up well in the green as we speak right now. Adani Gas 4.6% higher, Green up nearly 5%, Wilmar up 25 nearly. Adani Enterprises should come up here on your screens, um, you know that's pretty much the whole core and uh, the most liquid of the names, 2037, an uptick of 2.5% is what you're seeing on Adani Enterprises. IGL, given that they're setting up the smart meter manufacturing plant with Genesis, IGL starts of 6 tenths of a percent higher. And there's of course Sun Pharma as well after the acquisition completion of Concert Pharma. Uh, and then Power Grid, which is looking at an investment of 524 crore rupees to Eastern Region Expansion Scheme. These are a couple of stocks which are in focus. Let's see whether there's any follow through on MGL after that near about 9% move that the stock saw in Monday's session. And by the way, the Sriram Finance uh, uh, block deal, 91 lakh shares have traded hand. That's uh, almost equating to about 2.5% equity which has changed hands in a block deal. It's not currently flat as we speak right now. So it's largely really metals and IT which I can spot as a red point on the screen. But half a percent lower, Anisha, not all that bad. Yeah, not all that bad. And there are pockets which are actually doing well. IT surprisingly is actually holding up in the green. Especially if you look at the mid-cap names, they seem to be doing all right. Okay, no, it's now moved into the red again and it's up. Uh, Names like Viprotesis, etc., which are down in the trading section. Most of the sectors are trading in the red, with the exception of media. That's because the entertainment is reacting positively, and Sun uh, TV2 has opened with a bit of a green start. So, overall, tempered, uh, yes, but 17,625 is where we are at for the Nifty at this point of time. Let's take the first trades then. Kunal, you go first. What are you spotting? <clears throat> so, yeah, nothing, uh, you know, uh, I would say concerning for the markets, at least as of now, we are just Opening with the kind of text, the HDX Nifty was indicating 50 points odd on the Nifty and 150, 180 on the Bank Nifty. Uh, so we'll probably wait out for at least the first hour or so to just try and understand the patterns of the markets. But then the stock which I would be looking to buy uh, at opening would be Sipla. My sense is that the stock has come back into a deep oversold territory on the indicators. Uh, so I think it's a good contra bet from current levels, expecting the targets or the stock to hit back levels of 900 plus over the very near term. Okay, just wanted to flag out Kirloskar Oil Engines as well because that had started with an uptick of almost 3% but it's piled on gains and it's a 9% move that you're witnessing at this point of time. We pointed out how the 13% equity has changed and it's met, the supply has been met with enough demand and that's the reason you're seeing that momentum on the stock as well. But Nuresh, in the meantime, what are the trades that you are executing at this time? Any opening trade? That would be IGL uh, in reverse gas. The stock has broken out above the 445, 450 mark. Uh, expecting it to scale to slowly towards 480 to 500. Okay, thank you so much, Nuresh, for that. But with that, let's welcome the most powerful women in business. At least that's the word coming in from Fortune. Devina Mehra joins us now to talk to us about the markets as well. Devina, hi. Good morning uh, and wishing you a very happy Women's Day. Um, it's, it's usually said that women are better investors, uh, more patient, more diligent, etc. Would you concur with the view? Hi, good morning and uh, happy Women's Day to you as well. Um, uh, and that's what the data shows. The data shows that uh, oh, women get better results than men. Uh, but on the other hand, it also shows that women are less confident than men. So as I always tell people that have this 
on in front of you, uh, wherever you sit, your workplace or at home, uh, that confidence does not equal competence because I find a lot of women are diffident about managing their own money, uh, whereas uh, they should be because there is really no independence without financial independence. So that is a, a sort of cause for me to uh, get people and uh, women to manage their own money. Absolutely, Devina. Couldn't agree more with you and I can uh, vouch for at least Anisha Avar and me that we manage our own money and financial independence is prime and supreme for at least the three of us. And I hope, you know, uh, people like you and even us for that matter can only inspire women out there to take their finances sure. in their hands on their own money, no questions asked, and do whatever they want and with their money. And spend whatever we yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... Uh, Devina, I mean, you know, for women out there who are watching us right now, or for that matter, any investor out there, um, if they're starting today, what's the piece of advice that you would give them? Where is it that they should park their money? What kind of asset allocation? What country? Con considering, you know, there are just so many avenues out there to invest in right now. Yeah, so first of all, I mean, the good part for people who have limited time to uh, spend on the investing game is that most of your returns 80 to 90 percent come from asset allocation not from uh, stock selection so we all like to talk about what was the last multi-bagger or what's the next multi-bagger at parties but that is for entertainment uh, so the real important issue is to get your asset allocation right so i am not a voter ever that even if you are young and in a good job that you should put 100% of your money in equity because you will and may need some money maybe for higher education, maybe for to uh, down payment on a house or an emergency, so whatever. So have an asset allocation, of course, it will be more towards equity when you are younger. Uh, so because in equity, the predictability is over the long term, not over one or two years. Uh, so that, that is one part. And could you mention countries because I always also say that uh, uh, do not expose yourself to scars, which is single country, single currency, single asset risk. So if you are only in, let's say, the Indian stock market, that is uh, uh, that is not good enough because like in the course of my career from the time I started when US dollar was 12 rupees, it is now 80 to 83 rupees. So that's an 85% depreciation right there. So look at... Uh, uh, global investing and uh, global investing again does not mean buying a single other country which is like people think that I bought a NASDAQ ETF and hence I am globally diversified that's simply not good enough which is why we you know we introduced a globally diversified product which starts as low as ten thousand dollars only around eight lakh rupees because we I mean this again is a cause because I think you know if every Indian investor uh, should have a reasonable part of their portfolio in 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 the global uh, basket uh, so that is the thing the other important tip i'd like to give is that don't be at either end of the risk spectrum because uh, last year i used to see people who have uh, never even invested in equity going straight from fixed deposits to crypto and option trading so that kind of thing can be disastrous. So don't be at either end of the risk spectrum because if you're in 100% safe assets for 100% of your corpus, then you will barely beat inflation if that. So that so you, you can't be there either. So women often it is said are great at savings but not so good at investing. So you have a balanced portfolio where you have different types of assets including you know a little bit of gold and so on but have a diversified asset allocation. All right. Those are certainly pearls of wisdom, not just for women, but for everyone out there. Hi, morning, Devina. So, you know, in your years of investing and the experience and lessons that you've learned along the way, while you did give us a sense as to what the asset allocation should be, are there any, uh, you know, hard don'ts in terms of investing or even in a market environment like this, certain companies that you believe one should really refrain from putting their money in? What would be your take? I, uh, you know, rather than talk about which specific companies today, I would say that uh, risk management should be very central to whatever investing you are doing. I mean, certainly that's the way we do our 
uh, portfolio and fund management, which is that uh, risk management comes before return maximization. We always say that 60% of the fees you pay is for risk management. And we use a whole lot of tools, including, you know, basic stuff like uh, uh, making sure there is adequate liquidity in the stock, because like, especially in small caps, you know, you see the liquidity when it's going up and then when it starts going down, all the doors close and you can't exit. Uh, so right from there to uh, diversification again. So, so this is again, diversification is an important thing which every investor should look at. Uh, 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 that uh, you, if you are doing investing, even on your own only or, or even on a do-it-yourself basis, at least have 25. 30 stocks and it's not just the number of stocks it should be across sectors because i find too many professional fund managers also saying that i invest in my circle of competence which is really a euphemism for comfort zone that i invest if i understand two or three sectors that's where i will invest and that becomes a problem because no theme runs forever you know even if it's a so-called steady business even if you look at fmcg for instance uh, you know the 2020, when it was the flavor of the season, I had done a full TV interview on that, that if you look at the history even of FMCG, there have been long periods when the steadiest of companies underperform or give no returns at all. You know, Bata gave zero returns for 15 years. Hindustan Lever from 1999 to 2010 hardly gave any returns. So if you are in a few sectors, there might even be times when you do very well, but that is not sensible. So uh, follow a system in a systematic basis, choose 25, 30 stocks. And even then, even then, some of them are going to be duds. Again, we, this is another thing you must remember that one of the smartest thing you can do is that when you are investing, tell yourself, I may be making a mistake because the best investors in the world, Warren Buffett and so on included, are not right let alone 100% of the time, even 80, 90% of the time. You are doing very well if you are right 60, 65% of the time. So some of the things you choose are going to be done. So exit uh, when the story you thought didn't play out. And especially if the price falls, we are very strict about stop loss limits. So because otherwise you can always tell your stories that this stock is different. I must wait it out and so on. So have risk management in place, choose carefully systematically having understood uh, how financials work and so on. And then if you are you know, lucky, then out of those 25, 30 stocks, some of them may turn out to be multi-baggers, but uh, no one ever picks a portfolio of only multi-baggers. So it's uh, always a myth to ask somebody that which is going to be the next multi-bagger. Oh, well, yes, but one set of stocks which had been a big uh, multi-bagger was the Adani group of stocks, right? But of, of late, obviously, we have seen a lot of volatility around it. But now with the recent news flow and the sentiment uh, turning a tad bit more positive, would you be a buyer for Adani group of stocks or even the PSU banking names because they had seen uh, a bit of a negative reaction as well? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we uh, follow an artificial intelligence and machine learning system as our base. So that system has rarely liked the Adani group, barring you know, the cement stocks at times. So uh, I think we did hold Adani ports also for a short time in the middle. Uh, uh, so as part of our risk management system and the fact that uh, in terms of financials, it was very difficult to justify the valuations. Uh, the Most of the other Adani names we have uh, never the bought and uh, we still don't hold that, hold those. As far as the banks are concerned, um, you know, we, after uh, being uh, very negative and with very low weight in banks, right, from 2020, 2021, and from the middle of 2022, we went market weight in banks, which because of price movement then became somewhat overweight. And uh, even when, you know, even before the Adani group had recovered, uh, I was on TV and I had said that, you know, the reaction on the PSU banks and banking in general seems to be overdone because it had affected even banks which had no exposure to the group. Uh, so the, we, we have continued to hold the banks and you know, we still continue to hold them. So that, uh, that I think was a, a more of a temporary issue for the banking sector. I don't see an imminent danger from this angle. Of course, I mean, in banking, negative surprises hide somewhere or the other and may come out at some stage. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we continue to be reasonably positive on banks. 
Devina, let's completely switch gears. Tell me what's the plan today. I know you're a fellow Ranbir Kapoor fan as well. Have you booked your tickets? His movie releases today. Oh, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just gave you a good idea then what to do this evening. But I have actually not yet started going to theatres. I'm still being quite conservative on the uh, risk of infection given my mother and daughter. <laughs> Okay, fair point. Uh, I can tell you we're more than making up for it here in Mumbai. But uh, good to have you on the show, Devina, as always. Good speaking with you. Thank you. Great being there. Okay, that's the word coming in from Devina Mehra. Let's just quickly scan what the market is up to. Six tenths of a percent lower, about a hundred point knockdown. But that's okay considering what's happening with the global markets as well. 17,761 is where we're currently at. In fact, I want to just check in on what Asia is up to because some of those markets are actually seeing a bit of a recovery. Japan, for instance, is now mildly into the green. Uh, while, of course, you know, Hong Kong is still down two and a half percent. Shanghai is still down half a percent. Just a little bit of a recovery, at least in the Japanese equity markets. For us, 100 points lower, Hal, Gale, Adani Enterprises, Z, Shriram Finance. These are stocks which are fairly buoyant. While the breadth of the market is still grappling, there is, of course, some pressure on metals. So, Hindalco, Nalco, both those stocks are down. There's Deepak Nitride as well, lower by about 2.5%. Nokri is down quite significantly. 3.5% is the kind of cut that it's currently seeing. And then there's uh, Pandan Bank as well, which is lower by about almost uh, 3%. But just like Devina Mehra, many women as well are making their mark in the financial industry across the world. But there is a long way to go. A survey suggests that women investors in India owned about 20% of financial assets as of 2022. Vamakshi is here to talk about how women uh, participation is actually increasing in the financial world. Vamakshi? Well, absolutely. Women's interest in the investment world is definitely on a rise and this can be evidenced by the fact, as you can see, that their share in the total investor base as a percentage of total financial assets, which includes stocks, bonds and MF, have actually gone up from 17.5% that we saw in 2021 to 21% uh, in 2022. Now, when we only talk about equities specifically, now their participation, as you can see, has gone up by nearly 180 basis points from 117 11.7% seen in September 2019 to nearly 13.5% in 2021. Now, as far as the mutual fund face, uh, space is concerned, their participation has tripled in the last five years. And it is also interesting to note that nearly 30% of the total user base are millennial women. And not just as investors, women are making their mark even as fund managers. Uh, they're taking charge over the investment world. Now, 82% AUM that is, management, uh, that is managed by women fund managers has outperformed peers in the last five years as well. So largely, their participation has been increasing but it can be further boosted by these factors that is raising awareness as well in the as well as their financial literacy promoting diversity as well as addressing systemic barriers all right, that's pretty interesting. Thanks very much for giving us those details. We have seen a boost in women participation, but still a long way to go. Let's just quickly look at the markets. And at 17,650 on the brink of that level, we're down a third of a percent across the board. But let's connect then with Rakesh Kumar Jain. He's the director of finance at Gale, uh, joining in on the show. Thank you so much for taking time out and being with us on the show. Let's uh, begin by talking about uh, the pipeline tariff hike because there was an integrative tariff rate which was earlier submitted at 68 rupees per MMBTU. Um, if you could just clarify to investors why we've seen different rates then at about 60 uh, per MMBTU and which is the rate that is being tracked and which is more important? Yeah, so uh, transmission tariff, as you know, is determined by PNGRB the Petroleum and Natural Gas Regulatory Board. And in terms of the regulation, we are required to submit the tariff for their approval. So the number you are talking about is basically integrated tariff number, which Gale has submitted to PNGRB for their approval. Gale, based on the regulatory provisions, has submitted a, uh, no, a number of 68 rupees plus per MABTU. And the number which is coming in the uh, uh, PCD for unit by tariff, that they, in, they have indicated that the approval will be around six, uh, the indicated number will be 60.92. So, 
so what has happened today currently the tariff uh, is levied to end consumer is pipeline to pipeline basically if a consumer uses one pipeline the tariff for one pipeline is levied if consumer uses more than one pipeline the number of pipeline the consumer uses tariff is levied based on contractual path so pngrb has come out with a concept of integrated tariff uh, which is a subset of unified tariff so in terms of the integrated tariff the in physically interconnected pipeline tariff will be uh, will be a single number uh, the gale has submitted uh, the uh, tariff for uh, nine of its pipeline which are physically interconnected Right. You know, the revision in uh, transmission tariff is expected to happen by the end of this month or early next month. Are you confident that the rates submitted by you would be accepted and what is the kind of benefit uh, expected from the tariff uh, hike to begin with? See, the purpose of the, uh, the unified tariff is to, you know, increase the gas of, or reach of the gas to far-flung areas. Mm -hmm. As I explained, the currently the tariff is pipeline to pipeline tariff. Mm -hmm. This means if a consumer is sitting, say, in eastern part of the country and source the gas from western part of the country, the customer is required to pay the tariff of, say, uh, HBJ pipeline, thereafter Jagdishpur Haldia pipeline. And standalone tariff for these pipelines will be around three to four, three to four dollar per mm BTU. But if weighted average tariff is worked out, then the tariff or uh, tariff tariff comes out to one to one one and a half dollar even on journal basis. The PNGRB in its consultation has given the figure of rupees eighty, uh, that is around a dollar. So this this kind of tariff will enable the reach of reach of gas to far flung areas and will enable increase of share of gas in an energy basket which government also has a vision to increase the share of gas for in energy basket from 6 to 15 percent so uh, that's how this tariff will help and ultimately it will also help the investor in a sense one is helping the customer by making it affordable to far flung customers second it will help to uh, you know uh, pipeline transporters because the more volume when, when there are more customers, there is more transmission of gas, they, they, so more revenue will be available to the transporter. So that's how it will be a win-win situation for development of gas market and also from the investment perspective in the transmission segment. Sure, Mr. Jain, point taken and we understand that the final uh, you know, order will be out only by the end of the month or start of next month, but at least for integrated tariffs, there was this open house that was held on March 6th, we understand. Could you talk to us about what were the discussion points, uh, what was the agenda like and uh, what were the key takeaways from that meeting? Nee, there was an open house conducted by PNGRB uh, on March 6th and more or less the issue discussed were uh, uh, around that only uh, it, the discussion was first not on the unified tariff, it was on integrated tariff. So the basically open house is conduct, conducted to you know understand what kind of views various stakeholders have and then uh, then board listens to them and take you know, account for them in finalizing the uh, tariff. So the discussions were around that what kind of submissions Gale has made, what is going to be impact on that, what will be the change in revenue. Uh, what, what is the impact of, you know, as I explained, the impact of you uh, capex, which is to be considered like Jagdishpur Haldia pipeline capex, what will be the impact of change in regulatory framework and how this, uh, this integrated tariff will help in unified tariff. So all those discussions had taken place uh, uh, in the open house and board will consider uh, the, in the comments by various stakeholders before, you know, finalizing the tariff. And given that spot gas prices have come off from their recent highs, are you seeing a rise in demand in your transmission volumes because of this? And could you quantify what the percentage increase it has been so far in Q4 compared to Q3? Yeah, L let me give you a brief background. This year has been a quite a volatile year, uh, particularly because of the geopolitical situations. We have seen the spot gas price as, as, as high as you know, uh, for the for the futures uh, as, as published by Platts, uh, West India Marker, as high as sixty nine seventy dollar, uh, which is which is uh, abnormally high if you compare even with the spot price of ten to twelve dollar. So from that level, the spot prices has come down, and currently the spot prices are uh, hovering around in the range of thirteen to fourteen dollar. So with the change in spot prices, the spot uh, volume has now uh, you know spot volume market has come up. 
and uh, it is uh, it has increased if you compare with the uh, volume which is which was being supplied even by us uh, three to four uh, rather two to three weeks back it has increased by almost four million in terms of the uh, quantity four million uh, per day and in terms of percentage almost four percent so even though in spite of that increase we are uh, not at that level which we were supplying but uh, we we we, we uh, we, we, we on the year ba yearly basis last year we supplied a transmission volume of around 111 million mm -hmm. and uh, before this uh, reduction in price it was around uh, 100 to 106 to 107 now on, on currently it has come to 111 uh, 11 but then then uh, then few more things has happened because this is the spot price has not only uh, has affected the market or another uh, issue which has happened because of geopolitical situation of our contract we are not receiving the gas right you know but given the uh, bigger fall in henry hub prices the gas trading business has become favorable for how long do you expect this scenario to play out and are you able to sell all contracted lng that you're now sourcing at profit so in terms of henry hub price henry hub price has again gone up uh, 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 as high as US dollar nine per MMBTU when the when the spot price were uh, as I explained were higher, but uh, with the uh, you know uh, spot, uh, spot price cooling down, the Henry price has also cooled down. Even we have seen the Henry price uh, a week or or so back around below two dollar per MMBTU. But in terms of the fu uh, future predictability, we have seen the Henry price to be range bound within 3 to 4 dollar per MMBTU except for the period of winter where demands are more December to January. So even if you see the futures of the Henry of which are available and the, the prices are within the range of 3 to 4 dollar per MMBTU which is normal level for that uh, Henry of price. So we expect that uh, Henry of price to remain in that level. Okay, I wanted to shift focus to the pet chem business because that has been a tad bit slow. What's the situation on the ground at the moment? What's the utilization level? So, in, in view of the uh, Gazprom issue, we were not getting the gas. So, we put supply cuts to our own consumers or 10% supply cuts, even more for some of the consumers we brought down to supply or pay level instead of take or pay level. So, uh, because the, the, we were not having gas, we also uh, ramped down production at our petrochemical plant and we were producing around 40% of polymer as compared to, uh, you know, 100% capacity which we normally utilize. So, now, now since spot prices has cooled down, we have again started our polymer production at full level and we, are con we, we hope that we will continue to produce polymer at 100% in, in coming financial year. And when do you see a turnaround in the pet chem business? How are your product margins looking right now, given that ga gas prices as well have fallen? Yeah, uh, based on the current prices, which uh, which is around, not current prices, based on the prices which were prevailing a, a week or 10 days back, around 14 to 14.5 dollar the spot prices, we, we were able to recover the variable cost. Uh, but now since prices are further cooled down, so we hope that we will be uh, we will be get, uh, we will be recovering total cost because two things has happened not only the not only the uh, input gas prices has gone up but as compared to last year our uh, our polymer prices has also um, you know come, came down uh, which used to be around 100, uh, 1 to 1 lakh 25000 per metric ton currently it is around 1 lakh 14000 rupees per metric ton so that is also that is also impacted but now with the china opening up and demand has increased we expect that uh, the coming financially will be better from the perspective of polymer production and marketing sure so what is the status of uh, propane and the lpg unit i mean is the plant running at 100 percent utilization as the apm prices are high yeah propane and uh, lpg we are working at a normal level the uh, level which is uh, the kind of gas we are getting, we are to able to totally produce and fractionate and uh, we are uh, working at a normal levels. And is the company using any spot uh, LNG for any of its gas from volumes because that seems to be still um, not you know fully available at the moment? Uh, first, we expect Gazprom gas to flow. We are con continuously in 
touch with the uh, supplier and uh, recently they have uh, they have scheduled two cargoes uh, to be supplied in march uh, march, uh, march then this month only so we expect uh, that uh, at some point of time they they will uh, they will start supplying us gas at a normal level but but in order to meet the shortage we are not looking only for a spot a spot is not for a substitution of long term contract so we are dis in discussion with various suppliers uh, across globe uh, for sourcing of um, gas uh, for at least for one mmtp of gas so that we we are not only able to take care of the any shortage in the supply but also able to uh, cater to the new market which is coming up along our our new pipelines or new pipelines which are coming up or which are being commissioned now and can you run us through what the status is of the fertilizer plants by when they're expected to come online fertilizer plants have come online only the uh, one or two plants are in the ramping up stage uh, uh, and almost uh, all all plants are working and there will be further increase in terms of volume being gas volume being marketed and transmitted to the extent of 4 million otherwise almost all plants have come on, online right you know but recently china secured a 27 year uh, contract with qatar is gail also considering signing such similar contracts given that uh, new capacity is going to be coming up in qatar from 2027 are you in talks with any other party as there are news reports also which are suggesting that you are in discussion uh, to sign up a new uh, russian lng contract gail as a company is all uh, always looking for you know increase of gas share in the energy basket and that's how we are laying the infrastructure currently we are investing uh, in three pi major pipeline jagdish prahaldia mumbai nagpur jasukra and sirkakulam angul pipeline and in order to cater to customers not only to existing customer in order to cater the customer which are coming along these pipelines we are always in search of a uh, gas at a competitive rate uh, therefore uh, i'm uh, china has signed of course 27 year contract but uh, we are looking for uh, long term certainly long term contract but the duration of contract will depend on the pricing the kind of price we get so certainly we are there in the market for sourcing of additional gas and hopefully we will be able to click the deal very soon okay mr jain thank you so much for joining us today we we'll let you go on that note for the markets it's 50 points down for the nifty on the losing side you have aptus value housing which is down 4% Macrotech developers has been volatile of late. Today it's down four percent, and Bandhan Bank too is on the back foot. On the gaining side, it's Aegis Logistics, which is up a solid seven percent, and then of course Kirloskar Oil is seeing a surge of twelve percent. We told you how thirteen percent equity change hands, and the supply has been met with a good enough demand. So that's the reason that stock is high. And incidentally, JM Financial also wrote a note on the same uh, very recently. They have a buy call with a target price of four hundred rupees. they are calling the valuations inexpensive and they are saying that the management is committed to their 2x 3x strategy which means that they are targeting to double their stand alone revenue to 6500 crores by fy25 implying a 26% cagr on a revenue basis so all of that seems to be working well for that counter at the moment we'll slip into a very short break but don't go anywhere lots lined up when we come back Thanks for staying on with us. This is first trades. Uh, just to revisit some uh, individual movers and shakers in today's trading session, you've got uh, Kirloskar, which is in the spotlight. Remember, we got you that ETNow exclusive source base that the Kulkarni family likely sold stake via the block deals that took place earlier today. Z Entertainment in the spotlight. The company and the IPRS have entered into that settlement agreement in which all their disputes and claims have been settled. So that stock as well is uh, in the spotlight. And you've also got uh, something like uh, the entire. Adani group of stocks which has prepaid about 7300 crores worth of share backed financing let's move right on then and connect with sanjeev asthana he's the ceo at patanjali foods here to talk a little bit about what the implications could be if the government were to raise the import tax on palm oil as well as what their own financials are thank you so much for taking time out uh, given the fact uh, mr asthana that we've seen global commodity edible oil prices seeing a correction and imports increasing we understand the government is looking to increase the import tax on palm oil will this step be enough for farmers and producers Uh, so the two parts of the question that I'd like to answer with 
One is in terms of the increase uh, in the duty structure. That's very much a prerogative of the government. Uh, they have to look at the pricing, how it is uh, headed, and uh, because the impact is larger. The second uh, issue is that, uh, you know, how does it impact, uh, you know, the companies and the farmers in the country? Uh, there, I would say that, uh, you know, the prices recently in the oil seeds uh, have uh, sort of started looking downwards, especially you've got mustard oil, uh, mustard seed prices, which have started uh, coming off. And they are ruling at some Mondays below the MSP prices also. So that might be a source of concern to sort of look at uh, increasing the uh, duty duties. But uh, having said all of that, uh, I think as far as the companies are concerned, for them, it's a pretty much a pass through, uh, you know, model. Uh, so to us, uh, it doesn't impact. If at all, it might be partially beneficial for the industry. And certainly as a pro farmer uh, uh, sort of interest, uh, it would be worthwhile to for the government to explore that for certainly. Right. You know, you also have the largest palm oil plantation in the entire country. What is the growth that you've seen here in the last year? And what then is your strategy when it comes specifically to palm oil uh, going forward? So our strategy is very clear. What we have uh, committed to the government is that under the National Mission on Edible Oils Oil Palm, uh, the government uh, has a five-year project. We have committed to the government that we'll do half a million hectares of plantation. And uh, so the momentum has started picking up. This year, our expectation is that uh, we should do anywhere between 40 to 50,000 hectares uh, in 23-24. Uh, year after, we'll do about 125 to 150,000 hectares. And our focus uh, geographies are basically four states in Northeast and uh, three states in uh, Southern part of the country. And uh, we are pretty convinced that uh, we should be able to achieve all those objectives. So quite optimistic with respect to the expansion of the palm oil presence in the country as well. But Mr. Astana, um, the raw material prices have been fairly, uh, fairly volatile and so have been the prices when it comes to palm oil or even wheat, for instance, which has seen a bit of a spike off late. What does this mean uh, with respect to your margins and profitability? How are you defending those? Uh, so, our, uh, you know, after the sudden drop, uh, which happened in the second quarter, uh, which impacted uh, across the board all the global companies, our margins uh, should be very positive. Last quarter itself, we did exceedingly well. And this quarter also, we're expecting to show in good results. Uh, we hedge normally all the risks uh, that we carry in the books. And any uh, sort of increase in the prices or duty increase should be beneficial to players like us, who typically tend to carry large inventory, uh, you know, when we purchase. And uh, if any duty is announced or uh, the prices tend to spike, uh, broadly, it is beneficial for us. Since we're talking about margins, Mr. Astana, one of the triggers or levers have been also the value-added products, right? How is that expected to shape and what kind of contribution do you, are you expecting from the value-added products going forward? Uh, so value-added products, uh, there are two parts uh, to that. One is the products we are looking at premiumization of across the board on all our FMCG uh, businesses. Uh, so, for example, whether it's the biscuits or uh, it's look, uh, whether it's the nutraceuticals or it's the food businesses, we are looking at a premium uh, sort of addition strategy to sort of work towards. And second is the value addition that in the core businesses that we're doing by improving the, uh, you know, the brand structures that we have by improving the uh, better distribution by, you know, coming out with new product development. So that work is afoot and it is helping us increase our margin profile because a lot of businesses tend to get commoditized over a period of time. And I think innovating in the kind of offering that we give to the consumers uh, would make a big difference. So that is pretty much uh, working across the board in uh, all the businesses uh, that we have. Okay, so that point is taken as far as the premiumization as well. But what's your take with respect to uh, how the rural economy is shaping up? Uh, first up, if you can help us understand what kind of exposure do you have to the rural uh, markets at the moment and what's the demand differential like, let's say, in the urban tier one cities versus what's happening in rural India? Uh, so, in terms of the exposure that we have, as you know, that, uh, you know, all FMCG companies have got, uh, you know, very large exposure to the rural economy. Uh, we saw a big spike uh, in the rural demand, uh, especially during the second quarter and third quarter, when we saw that, uh, you know, the harvests happened, there was a wedding season, there was a festive season of Diwali, etc. It has slightly sort of tapered off in last uh, month, month and a half. But we're expecting that uh, we'll see a big uh, spike again in the rural demand. So that is one part. 
And uh, so in terms of our portfolio, we have seen, uh, you know, generally stable to improved uh, sort of offtake from the rural uh, markets. Our exposure is pretty much 60-40. Uh, so 60 is uh, we have towards the urban areas and uh, 40 is towards the rural areas. And I'm talking of tier one, tier two and tier three cities as urban and below that uh, in the rural economy. So that is uh, going uh, pretty much afoot. Uh, but rural areas, I think it tends to respond a lot to the harvest and uh, you know the festive season because there's a bit of uh, sort of change uh, overall. But in general, I think rural, the, the, the tough uh, part is behind us. I think we should see a good pickup in, uh, in, uh, in the rural demand uh, as well. Okay, and Mr. Sun, if I have it right, the expectation was that you'll end the year with a, you know, a net sales of around 30,000 odd crore rupees with an EBITDA margin of 6 to 7%. Um, what kind of growth rate are you expecting in FY24 going forward with respect to margins as well as the top line? Any targets? Uh, so our targets are very clear that uh, we've already stated that uh, in the core business of uh, edible oil, uh, which is commoditized, we'll do better than the country's demand. So country's demand typically in edible oil, we are witnessing between 3 to 4% growth. Uh, we are doing between uh, 4 to 6% and uh, idea is that we should work on high margin businesses, uh, high margin uh, sort of edible oil uh, space. Uh, in the FMCG businesses, our target is to maintain 15% uh, growth rate that we are pretty much committed to. In terms of the revenue numbers, I think uh, you know it would be wrong to give a sort of a number right away, but uh, the number that you stated and what we originally mentioned, we should be pretty much on course for that. Okay, Mr. Astana, we'll let you go on that note. Thank you so much for joining and speaking to ET now this morning. But time now to go across to our technical experts to understand what are the chart busters' ideas that they are spotting today. First, let's go across to Naresh. Naresh, tell us what's the stock that you are spotting as far as the chart busters segment go. So, an update on Mahanagar Gas Limited. Uh, the stock has been on radar for a breakout, and finally, the breakout has taken place. But the more important part is, if you look at the volumes uh, on the breakout day, this is almost like an 8 to 10x volume jump up. And whenever that sort of a volume jump up happens on a big, uh, say, 7 to 8% uptick day, that is generally an indication of a major trend change for the stock. So going forward, I would expect it to eventually go towards 11, 1200 and even towards a new 52-week high and an all-time high. And uh, the stop loss for that trade would be 900. And going forward, any dips, there should be a little bit of a fade off or uh, say any opportunities going forward, it should be an accumulate. Even at current levels, one could start off with an allocation and keep accumulating on the dips. Because whenever we've seen such a 10x volume jump up, uh, we generally see a, a longer term trend. And this has been a clean uh, triangle breakout and a cup and hand out breakout in the near term. So the whole gas uh, stocks look interesting, but MGL could be one of the interesting ones on dips. We take it across to Kunal as well. In Kunal NCC, uh, this is an erstwhile favorite. Well, absolutely, yes, uh, Aisha, and I think it's springing up on charts with, uh, you know, ticking off all the, you know, boxes, right? Now, as you can see, the charts for NCCs, that the stock has been showing a lot of recovery over the near to medium term. This was the low the stock had made in 2022 when it had hit that levels of 50-55. This was the high the stock had made in 2021, a double top as such. So, after a steep correction from 90, uh, 98-99 levels back towards 50, the stock has made a V-shaped recovery. So, this is a classical V-shaped recovery for the stock and when we look at this in the context of the stock price over the last two, two to three years it's forming a classical cup and handle pattern this is a breakout for uh, ncc breakout zone for ncc which is just around the 1999 mark but the volumes in this move for the stock has been very very strong it's indicative that the stock is heading towards not just a short term breakout or the breakout of this 1999 mark but a breakout which could potentially lead the stock to almost 30 to 40 rupees higher from current levels so a breakout above 100 levels could open up a big trend for NCC over the medium to long term. And I believe expectations of the stock coming back towards the all-time levels of 140, 150 could not be ruled out for the stock uh, over the medium to long term. So it's a stock which has to be on traders radar, especially from positional play above the 100 levels. Right, okay. Time to get in some stock-specific trades as well. Kunal? So two buy calls. The first one is actually a barn gale. The stock has been looking very strong. Over the last four or five days, we've seen some good pickup of price action. So maintain the bullish stance on Gale, targets of 120, stop loss 105. And Petronet is the other stock which has uh, again given a swing breakout on the charts, breaking past about the triple two levels of resistance. So buy with a target of 240, stop loss at the triple two mark. Right, Naresh, let's get uh, your strategies too. 
So uh, again, oil and gas. Uh, so by an IGL, the stock has given a breakout of 445 levels. A stop loss at 435 in a positional target price of 500. Second is a continuation by an ONGC. The momentum continues. A stop loss at 154 in the target price of 175. There you have it, all your top strategies on Chart Busters. Moving right on then, what's going on in the world of commodities? Let's take it across to my colleague Vinny, who joins in with the latest. Morning, Vinny. Good morning, and let's talk about the oil prices. A bit of a recovery we are seeing coming in this morning because of the... Uh past couple of sessions there were a lot of losses coming in for the oil prices but yes slight bit of a recovery this morning mainly because of the prospects of tightening US supplies uh, and that fear of the interest rate hike that has actually been uh, set off by this uh, tightening of US supplies so keep an eye out on that one uh, gold prices uh, have seen a bit of a drop coming in trading somewhere on the $1,810 per ounce dollar has surged uh, past that 105 mark so because of that uh, we're seeing uh, that dollar had actually seen a bit of a drop this morning and also do not forget fed chair power had also said that interest rates are likely to be higher than previously anticipated so that's a factor that's coming in for gold prices as well lastly let's just talk about aluminium prices they have seen a bit of a drop this morning um, given the aluminium smelters in uh, yunnan have complete uh, have uh, complete production cuts as well so on the back of this aluminum price is seeing a bit of a we let you go on that note. Thank you so much for joining us. But a good recovery is what is underway at the moment. The market is almost moving into the green as we speak. 17,700 has been scaled for now. So definitely showing some buying momentum um, as of now. It's Adani Enterprises, which is the top gainer at the index level, a 3% gain coming in there. LNT is having a good day, so 1.6% higher. Bajaj Auto, despite a bit of mixed commentary coming in from the management, talking about exports, which continues to be sluggish at this point of time, though they're ex expecting some sort of recovery in the next few quarters is holding up with a gain of 1.6 percent and that's followed by the likes of Britannia and TPC etc as well. On the losing side is Sindalco which is down 2 percent, IT is definitely not having a great day, Tech Mahindra is down 1.5 percent, Infosys 2 is under pressure and HCL2 uh, is in the red. The advanced decline ratio has also become a tad bit better so you have uh, just the advances which is around 1000 stocks versus 900 decline so that also is looking better and look at the recovery in the bank nifty as well almost moving into the green as we speak just a cut of around 25 points with the india wick spiking almost four percent time now to slip into a very short break but don't go anywhere when we come back we'll talk with the management of kota mahindra bank